Eagle Community Television presents Community Connection with your host, Mike Cooper. Hello and welcome again to Community Connection from Eagle Community Television, our community connected. Thanks for watching and thanks to our producer, Jeff Durall. We're at the uh, Livestock Arena at uh, Fort Hayes State or K-State Ag Research Center and we're talking with uh, John Yeager, beef cattle scientist at K-State Ag Research Center. And uh, John is visiting with us today about an anniversary which is taking place, a 100 year anniversary. It's the centennial of the Kansas State University Ag Research Roundup. Hard to believe 100 years, it is, John. It is. Tell us about the Roundup itself. First of all, what is it? The Roundup was developed so we could share our research results with, with local and regional producers. And, and that's really why we're here, is to develop research that's applicable to producers in Western Kansas and, and the Great Plains region, and, and try to find things that will help them remain competitive. And, and so in doing that, we wanna share our results, and that's, that's why they uh, held the first roundup in 1914. That's kind of the overall mission of the Ag Research Center, John, as you do the research, you do the trial and error, if you will, and then you translate that to the uh, producers. That's correct. Talk about the Roundup history then. I know uh, the presentation coming up for the Roundup this year on April 17th, uh, and uh, obviously a big turnout's expected for the 100th anniversary. Talk a little about the history, take us back. Um, Roundup used to be primarily a hands-on kind of tour, really, where, where they, they would either start here or at another location, look at the cattle that were on test, talk about the results, um, then go and look at, at maybe pastures and, and post-grazing and talk about how they were managed. Uh, they would travel to the beef cow-calf unit and, and talk about the research done on the cow-calf side. Um, they held a picnic at what used to be uh, Custer Park mm -hmm. over on the east side of the station uh, along Big Creek. And, and so it was, a, it was a very big deal and uh, attendance would be in the hundreds during those early years. And back in the early years, John, that was really basically the only source of information that many of the producers uh, had. That's true. That's true. There, there weren't all the publications we have today. There was an internet. And, and so uh, really the only place to find new information about, about raising, rearing, mm -hmm. caring, and feeding livestock was, was here at the station. What about the timing of it? Usually in early spring uh, after calving and such as that. Uh, well, talk about the timing for uh, a moment. The timing has always been um, sometime in April. Um, for, a, for a period of years, it was in late March. But uh, it's always been in that spring period. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of it has to do with trying to, to match up with producer schedules when they may be available to come to the event. And, and also kind of it fits with uh, research timelines when you're wrapping up feeding trials or, or calving trials and, and those kinds of things. Talk about some of the highlights. I know you can't cover 100 years in the time we have a lot of, John, but talk about some highlights that you'd like to emphasize over that period of time, and maybe that'll help us with kind of the development of beef cattle production and the research done at the Ag Center. Uh, I'll do my best. There, there, there's a lot to choose from, and, and there's some that I think are truly milestones mm -hmm. that, that uh, research that was conducted at this location and, and not any place else in the world. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's some really unique things that I've come across, and there's also some things that uh, we thought we were doing somewhat novel research, and they, they had tried similar things in the past. But uh, really, back as far as uh, 1915, they were doing work to uh, examine the rate of gain and optimum age of breeding for replacement heifers. And, uh, even when I was in college, they were talking about optimum age for, for breeding replacement heifers. And so that work was done very early on. And there, there were a lot of the research that I uh, thought was notable was uh, very forward thinking for its time. Um, another would be uh, looking at different protein supplements. Everyone was concerned about 
getting cottonseed meal in uh, by rail car from the east versus alfalfa hay grown locally, what was the best protein source. And, and um, pre-1920, really, there wasn't a great understanding about rumen function and how animals utilize nutrients. And so they compared several different protein supplements and saw no difference between them. Well, we know, we know why now because of uh, protein is protein once it enters mm -hmm. the rumen. But at that time, it, it was uh, pretty early for its time and uh, pretty novel. Um, one that I found amusing was that during the 1930s, during the great drought, mm -hmm. um, during 1934, six of the 10 studies conducted with the cattle uh, utilized some form of Russian thistle because that was the only plant that, that grew well during the drought. Mm -hmm. and, and there was a lot of interest by producers, that's all they had available. Mm -hmm. And so the, the station um, tried several different methods of harvesting, processing, mm -hmm. and, and feeding to see what worked the best during those drought years. Did that continue? Was there any uh, further uh, application that could be used <laughs> for our current uh, crop of Russian thistle? <laughs> uh, not at this time, but... Uh, yeah. You know, it's, uh, it was, I thought, very novel. You pointed out something uh, in your previous statement about uh, the different uh, protein sources that I think is interesting and expands on how the Ag Center is so important to uh, telling farmers what's going on and what's new and what's forthcoming. And that was the difference in protein. I mean, normally you would think of using the traditional feeds that were available locally and within reach, but then again importing some uh, feeds and whether they were valuable or viable or not. Very important research work done there, I think, John. Yeah, I, I would agree. And, and uh, you know, since the ethanol boom, then we've, we've started feeding distillers byproducts mm -hmm. out of the ethanol plants and, and uh, you know, it, it is very different from our traditional oilseed protein supplements in, in terms of how much is degradable in the rumen versus how much is, is bypass. And so uh, we've done a lot of research with that recently and, and, and that's one of those projects I thought we were being very novel and, and reacting to a, a new product. But uh, back in 1951, they were feeding distillers grains out of, out of alcohol breweries mm -hmm. and, and looking at, at different grain types and different forms of, of the distillers bright product. Well, you've been in the uh, beef cattle science business here at the Ag Center about eight years now, I believe. Yes. Um, talk about some changes and innovations and uh, research that you've done specifically to highlight uh, your work. Well, thank you. Um, uh, back to the distillers, um, one of the drawbacks to wet distillers is it has a very short shelf life. Mm -hmm. And so uh, trying to get that product um, to a cow-calf producer that, that can't feed it rapidly before mm -hmm. it starts spoiling was, was an issue we addressed. And, and we actually found a low-cost method to store that just by covering with black plastic mm -hmm. and excluding oxygen. Previous research had used low quality feeds, ground it, mixed it to get the dry matter up, then mm -hmm. packed it like silage. And uh, this really allowed producers to start buying distillers when it was cheapest in the summer, when there was low demand, and store it for the winter mm -hmm. when they needed protein supplement for their cow herd. What else in those eight years that comes uh, to mind? <clears throat> we've done a, essentially eight continuous years of, of management of calves. And a lot of the preconditioning programs nationally are, were developed with the idea of calves coming from the southeast to the Great Plains to be fed on the Great Plains and in our large commercial feedlots. Um, the adoption of preconditioning programs has been somewhat low and they're, they're somewhat intensive and labor, labor and cost intensive. And so we've been looking at for calves born, reared, and fed on the Great Plains, does it need to be that intense? And we've really found that, that the length of the preconditioning period can be much shorter, the degree of vaccination can be less, and the calves' health uh, still is as good as, as calves that have gone through a, a very rigorous preconditioning program. Um, 
in re regard to the more recent drought, um, back in the 80s during that uh, period when feed prices were high and there was some drought, there was a, a lot of interest in ammoniation of wheat straw mm -hmm. to increase digestibility and, and the protein content. Uh, we've, we've gone back to that research now and uh, looking at, at lower rates of ammoniation because anhydrous ammonia cost is so high and we're seeing uh, more than half the response with just half the, the anhydrous application rate. And so we can cheapen the inputs and still get very good response. You're also having, as they've done over the 100 years of, uh, of the uh, Roundup uh, here at the Ag Center, John, you've had to adapt to conditions, including the very dry conditions that we're currently uh, experiencing. That's right. We've, we've done um, some early weaning research, mm -hmm. and, and we've had a lot of producers call on uh, implementing early weaning of calves to try to save forage for the cows. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, actually placing cows into dry lots like feed lots and feeding them during late summer into winter. And uh, we've come up with some very low cost uh, diets to feed those cows so producers can hold on to their cows and not have to sell them. John, we know that uh, the work at the Ag Center translates directly to the producers and the information that's uh, gleaned through your research goes directly to them. How does it impact the consumer? How does the consumer benefit from the work at the Ag Center? Well, the, there's a couple couple different ways I see our work really benefiting the consumer. One is, is uh, partially John Brethauer's ultrasound research and uh, um, being able to market cattle at a more optimum endpoint. Um, also using that technology to select breeding replacements, whether they be the bulls or the heifers, that are higher in marbling and lower in back fat. So we, we try to decrease the fat on the, on the outside of the meat and the animal, reduce wastage, but increase the marbling that, that gives the meat juiciness and flavor. And so in that regard, that's a direct benefit to the the consumer. Um, also, just uh, finding low-cost techniques, management techniques to keep producers in business mm -hmm. um, is, is going to help hold down beef prices. Right now, that's not the case, but that's due to drought uh -huh. and, and the sell-off of a large number of, of cows across the nation. And if producers can translate that into better production costs and more efficient costs, that translates directly to the consumer to be able to afford beef prices. Yes, both both for beef cost and, and in, in rural agricultural communities mm -hmm. in Kansas, um, it, it, remain, it keeps the viability of the community alive by having those beef producers in business. April 17th, the Kansas State Ag Research Center and the 100 years of Roundup as we visit with beef cattle scientist John Yeager. Thanks for watching Eagle Community Television our community connected.